All right. Please bow with me. Holy Father and divine God, we long to be in your presence, to praise your holy name before your throne and to bow before Jesus Christ, your righteous son in the spirit. And we praise you and we give you thanks. This afternoon, as we continue our studies in Matthew that brought by Ken Chumbly, we pray that you would help us to drink deeply from your well of truth. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. As we said earlier, we're introducing you to Ken Chumbly from Rantoul, Champaign area, Illinois. And uh, just take it away. Well, thanks, Steve. Rob, it's good to be back doing this and uh, to the Fultondale Church, anyone else who might be uh, watching in. Uh, what I'm trying to do is to show that everything in the life of Christ had in view the cross. I believe everything in the Gospels is centered spiritually, logically around the cross. And so I want to talk in this study about how the cross is seen in the baptism of Jesus Christ. You know, as far as the order of the New Testament books, I'm primarily relying on Matthew for my text. There is no evidence that the Holy Spirit inspired the order of the, of the New Testament books that we have in our Bible. But there's obviously um, a literary arrangement to the books, even a logical arrangement. The arrangement is not chronological because most people who have looked into this think that some of the writings of Paul predate the Gospels by many years in some cases. Um, some who have looked into this think that the Gospel of Mark was possibly the first gospel that was written. I don't know about all of that. Um, and so the, 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 the New Testament's not arranged chronologically. Um, it's not arranged according to length, even though the epistles of Paul are arranged according to length. Romans is the lengthiest epistle he wrote. Philemon is the shortest. And you want to go sometime and check all of the verses in each one, you'll see that there is a descending order in the epistles of Paul, and that's the way they, they are arranged the way they are. Um, I don't know why or how Matthew came to be the first book of the New Testament, um, but it makes a lot of sense that it is. Uh, you know, I, I, I've said that that there is a logical arrangement, and I think that is best seen in the fact that Luke and Acts, which were written by the same individual to the same individual, by Luke to Theophilus, Luke and Acts, which are volume one, volume two of the writings of Luke, are broken up by the Gospel of John. John is put in the middle of them, between them, there in our New Testament. So, so that indicates some thought has been given to the order of books in the in the New Testament. And I think whoever thought Matthew should come first, that was a brilliant thought that they had, a, a, a brilliant decision. And the reason I say that is because Matthew is a, a hinge book. It, it's the hinge on which the Bible, Old New Testament, turns. And that's because in Matthew, we have all of these statements that look back to the Old Testament. This was done that it might be fulfilled. This was done because it is written. It was written. And so Matthew has a heavy emphasis on how the life of Christ fulfilled Old Testament prophecy. But then Matthew, as do all of the Gospels, point forward to the end of Christ's story, to the cross. And I'll try to show in this study how the baptism of Christ points forward to the cross. Now, I want to do this in two ways. First, I just want to get the particulars of the story in front of us. And then secondly, we'll look for the cross in the particulars. And so the story is this. For many months, John the Baptist had been preaching repentance and baptism for the remission of his sins. And people came to John from all over 
Judea. And I, I suspect that uh, John's disciples, John's movement was looked upon as a sect, like the Pharisees were a sect, like the Essenes were a sect. Now we have the Baptist sect. And then one day John looks up and he sees standing before him Jesus. And immediately he sees a disconnect. Here's why. The reason people came to John from, from all over Judea was that they came to him seeking help with an ancient problem, with a contemporary problem, with a universal problem, and that problem was sin. That problem was guilt. They came to John because they thought John could help them with the problem of their sin. And John was baptizing people willing to repent of their sins. And now Jesus is standing there, and John says, this isn't right. If anybody ought to baptize anybody, you ought to baptize me. I, I, I shouldn't be baptizing you. John's reaction to Jesus was much like Peter's reaction at the Last Supper when Christ gets up, ties on the apron of, of a slave, and starts washing the apostles' feet. When he gets to Peter, Peter says, this isn't right. Be it far from thee, Lord, that you should wash my feet. Peter saw the disconnect. And John saw the disconnect because he did not believe Jesus needed his baptism. He didn't believe Jesus apparently had anything to repent of. And uh, how did John come to that knowledge? Well, I, I think probably through family history. Uh, John's parents had both had heavenly visitations. Uh, Mary had gone to visit John's mother before Jesus was born, while John was pregnant with, uh, John's mother was pregnant with him. And that had to be something the family talked about all through John's growing up. And so he had this, this sense that his, his cousin, his relative Jesus, did not need to be baptized. And so with that set before us, I want to read what, what Matthew says here in verse 13 through 17, Matthew chapter 3, 13 through 17. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you are coming to me? But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he, John, allowed him. John baptized him. Now, of course, the key verse here is verse 15. Christ's response is, it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Now, what does that mean? Well, the basic meaning of righteousness is being right with God. In the Bible, that is the, the essential meaning of righteousness, that sinners are made right with God. Now, for that to happen, two things must occur. There has to be a sacrifice that is acceptable to God to atone, propitiate for the sin that the sinner had committed. Secondly, there has to be an identification between the sinner and the sacrifice. When you go back, read Leviticus 16, 21 to, to 22, the, the high priest uh, would lay his hands on the head of the sacrificial lamb on the head of the scapegoat. And then that animal bore the sins of the people and the laying on of hands symbolized the, the passing, the transmission, so to speak, of sin from the sinner to the innocent victim for the sacrifice. So you had to have a sacrifice and there had to be a connection between the sacrifice and the sinner. Now Christ came to be a sacrifice. John the Baptist had been been uh, talking about one who was coming. When John saw Jesus, John said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then Christ had to identify. He had to identify with sinners, and he did this in a number of ways, by simply becoming man, by being exposed to all that constitutes true humanness, 
And here it is, baptism. Christ takes his place in a line of sinners. In Mark 15, verse 28, at the cross, Mark says that Jesus was numbered with the transgressors. Well, he was numbered with the transgressors at his baptism. He's standing there in the sinner's line and waiting to be baptized, which was something John was doing to sinners. And so in his baptism, I think we have a symbolic action in which he showed his connection with sinner. I'm, I'm with you, he's saying. I'm going to stand with you. I'm going to be one of you by submitting to baptism. But now what is the, how do we see the cross really in that baptism? Well, this is easy. This isn't going to take very long. Of all the events in the life of Christ in which the cross is, is prefigured, I think the baptism of Christ is easily the most uh, obvious because of what Paul says in Romans chapter 6, verse 4. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism unto death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we all show, also should walk in newness of life. Baptism symbolizes a death, a burial, and a resurrection. Can you hear my neighbor mowing the grass? His, lawn, his lawnmower is right outside my window here, so I can barely hear myself. I hope you can hear me. But can uh, hear you fine. Okay. Well, you can hear the mower. Okay, good. Christ's baptism symbolized what would happen at the end of the gospel when he was put to death, buried, and then arose. In Luke chapter 12, verse 50, Christ tells his disciples, I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how I'm straightened till that be accomplished. He was talking about his death. So in being numbered with the transgressors, just as he was on the cross, in submitting to an action that symbolized death, burial, and resurrection, I think the cross is, is front and center in the baptism of Jesus. So, do you have any questions you'd like to follow up with? I'll do my best to, to try to give an answer. Well, well I'll ask one in, in light of uh, that uh, symbolism uh, is is Jesus here uh, actually stating uh, that he's going to die, be buried, and, and arise again without ec actually uh, doing it. He's going to symbolically do it. Uh, is that a part of this? Uh... Oh, yeah, I, I think so. Uh the Old Testament prophets often were asked by God to do what I refer to as a prophetic PowerPoint. They were asked to do something that in many ways made no sense. But they were asked to do it because of what it symbolized. Now, examples of the prophetic PowerPoint would be God telling Hosea, I want you to go out and marry a whore. Now, no self-respecting prophet would ever think about doing something like that. But God tells Hosea, I want you to go and do that because a whore is what I got when I married Israel. God tells Jeremiah, I want you to carve you a, a yoke and put it on your neck and wear it around. Everybody said, Jeremiah, what in the world are you doing? And, and Jeremiah would explain, this is what's coming to Judah. The Babylonian yoke's coming to Jew. So God would ask the prophet. He, he asked Ezekiel to play with toy soldiers. He tells Ezekiel, tonight, Ezekiel, I'm going to take from you the most precious thing in your life. I'm going to kill your wife. And that night, Ezekiel's wife died. God said, you're not to mourn. You're not to plan a funeral. You're to get up tomorrow and go out and preach. So there were these very extraordinary things that God would call the prophets to do. And Christ, of course, being a prophet that Moses talked about who would come. I think this baptism fits into that prophetic PowerPoint, an unusual singular demonstration meant to symbolize a far greater truth, that being Christ's death on the cross. 
Okay. All right. Uh, what do you think uh, John understood Jesus to be doing? John knew that Jesus had no sin, and, and certainly that's why he objected uh, in the beginning. Uh, what did you think uh, John is, is, is thinking? Well, I, I, don't, I don't think John believed Jesus had no sin because John knew Jesus was the Messiah. John tells us that God had told him he wouldn't know who the Messiah was till he saw the Spirit descending on someone at okay. their baptism. I think John's uh, disconnect, his uneasiness at baptizing Christ, was due to family tribal knowledge, knowledge within the family, that here, here's what was said about this child when he was born. I mean, his own mother, his own father can testify to him of their experiences and what God had told them. And so he, he probably, and he hadn't learned anything about Jesus in the intervening 30 years to, to um, uh, disprove what his parents, uh, to contradict what his parents had told him. So I think John just thought Jesus was a really, really good relative who did not fit in with the crowd of people coming to him to be baptized. And then when the spirit descended on Christ, then John knew for certain who the Messiah was. Hmm. Good point. I had never thought of it that way. Uh, talk a little bit more about uh, there in Matthew three, uh, uh, God speaking uh, and, and attesting to, the fact that Jesus is in fact his son. Yeah, that, that, when when uh, Christ comes up out of the water, um, the Spirit descends in the form of a, in the manner of a dove. I don't myself believe that means it looked like a bird had come down and alit on Christ. Uh, the, the Gospels are ambiguous in their language about this. I, I tend to think that what we're to understand is that the descent of the spirit in, in some bodily form, I've never known of God to take on the form of an animal in the Bible. He would take on the form of angels. He would take on the form of men, some, some human type form. So whatever form the spirit took, I, I think it probably referred to the fluttering motion of, of uh, doves coming into land. Um, and then God spoke saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And G. Campbell Morgan makes the point that that statement of God testified to the first 30 years of Christ's life, that in everything Christ had done in his first 30 years, he had pleased God. He is at that point an acceptable sacrifice. And then, of course, God will speak to other times. On the Mount of Transfiguration, this is my beloved son, whom I'm well pleased, hear ye him. And then, within just days of the death of Christ, when, when Christ asked his father, by his death, to glorify the father, the father says, I have glorified it, I'll continue to glorify it. So God, by those three statements, put his imprimatur, his stamp of approval, upon the life that, that Christ had led. Uh, indicating that he would be that acceptable sacrifice. Hmm. Very good. Rob, do you have a question? Yeah, I really don't. I, I appreciate what Kenny is saying, but uh, just kind of taking it all in. All right. Well, then wrap it up, Kenny, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll move on to the well, next yeah, presentation. Yeah. To wrap it up, you know, people say they were baptized because Jesus was baptized. No, that's not why we're baptized. Uh, Jesus was baptized because we have to be baptized. He had to be immersed, not just in water, but in death, in a sacrificial, vicarious death. And so he was made likened to us, and God indicating baptism as that point of demarcation from being unrighteous to being right with him, Christ came, submitted himself to that, 
thereby identifying with us. He's not ashamed to be, uh, for us to be called his brethren, Hebrews chapter 2 says. And uh, the cross being very visible, I think, in the baptism of Christ and what Jesus would accomplish by his death. Of course, I know you're aware of this, Steve, but the reason that is stated, so, and I hear that quite a bit, have through the years, uh, is that the, the understanding among some and the point they're trying to make is that Jesus was not baptized for the remission of sins and neither are we. That, that's the point they're trying to make. Well, I, I can see how denominationalists might try to make that argument. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, that's not a good argument because Mark chapter 1, verse 5, I think, specifically says that John's baptism was unto forgiveness of sins. Uh, it was a baptism of repentance. People had to commit to get out of the sinning business. And when they did that, John baptized them for, you pair, the forgiveness of sins. Yes. All right. We'll, we'll bring this lesson to a close, and we commend it to your attention and further study. And uh, we'll have another lesson shortly.